Ladies and gentlemen, my name's Paul, and in this Rick Game Theatrecom video, we're going to be analysing news of the Vega variety, which has popped up over the past 24 or so hours. As you probably ascertained from both the video title along with my introduction, yes, this news is going to squarely focus on Vega. At the end of the video, we're going to have a deep dive into some further details of the Vega architecture, which was revealed at Hot Chips. But we're going to start the video with RX Vega 56, because if you modify it with a 64 BIOS, the performance difference between the two cards is virtually indistinguishable. And then we're going to, in the middle, be discussing Vega pricing, because supposedly AMD are definitely losing money per GPU sold, and that's according to Vodzilla. But first of all, the 64 BIOS on the RX Vega 56. So this originated, as a lot of stuff tends to do actually, from the website Chip Hell. Specifically their forums, a, a member decided to basically see if an RX Vega 56 could be unlocked to a full fat 64. In other words, modify it, see if those additional compute units would be enabled or not. Well, bad news is no. It appears that this is not the case. You don't get the full 64. 56 is still enabled. You don't get those additional 8. But that isn't the end of the story. In fact, what is very interesting is that the 64 BIOS has a 1545 MHz boost clock and 945 MHz HBM2 clock. So that's about... A 70 megahertz difference, 75 if you want me to be precise, and of course there's also a rather large difference in the memory clock as well. Now you're going to say to yourself, well how much of a difference does that really make? Well, obviously it does depend upon the rest of your setup, but a standard RX Vega 56 using the default BIOS gets around 9400 on Firestrike Extreme. That's not too bad, right? On the other hand, if you were to modify it with the 64 BIOS, you get just over uh, 10,300, 10,340. But if you overclock it, that's when you get over 11,300, which, to put into context, is about a 1,000 points higher than an RX Vega 64 using the default BIOS. Now, if any brave souls want to try this and let me know your results, feel free. I'll link it in the video description. However, what I find rather interesting about this is why we're getting these performance differences. After all, if you were to do the maths in your head, you're going to say, well, shouldn't there be like, you know, I'm rounding it down here a little bit, but shouldn't there be about a 10% difference in performance just, you know, purely from the compute units. I mean, okay, they're running at the same clock speed. Let's just say that they're running 1500 megahertz each, just for sake of argument. Shouldn't there be, you know, still a difference in performance? Well, yes and no. Uh, it appears there's a couple of reasons behind this. And these are theories because, well, not, unfortunately, A, this is quite early in uh, development, and B, obviously not too many people have been testing it anyway. And C, well, you'll understand why I'm saying this, the last theory is a bit, uh, you know, unknown. But one of the reasons is certainly power and heat related. So in other words, because you don't have those additional uh, units enabled, in theory at least, the heat of the card uh, means that the, G uh, sorry, the heat of the card won't be quite so much. And therefore, in theory, the clocks should be slightly more stable. And I do wonder, and this is obviously something that's going to take a lot of investigation, but I do wonder if there's something to do with the drivers. In other words, some of the workload is not being properly distributed or not. Now, that's a theory, and it's a bit difficult to know this for a fact, but I do wonder if RX Vega uh, is not 100% distributing the workloads correctly. Either way, there's a couple of... Um, conclusions that we can have. If you're buying a reference design, and I stress a reference design, as it stands, go for the cheapest 56 you can get and flash the BIOS. Because there are two BIOSes on the Vega series, even if you bought one BIOS, it's not the you know the end of the world. You can basically get around it by simply switching to the other one, blah blah blah. On the other hand, as custom cards become more common over the next couple of months, obviously as the shortages of Vega, at least in theory, become less prevalent, one can make an argument that we should see, at least theoretically, those custom BIOSes have different power limitations, perhaps um, we should see more aggressive uh, clock speeds, and, at least in theory, 
because the cooler themselves are going to be more robust in theory, we might also see just a better performance overall. So it's going to be very interesting to see how all of this changes over the next several weeks. Next piece of news, uh, before we jump into the analysis of the extra information we have with the Vega architecture, and that is pricing. Now I'm going to report this as a rumor and as, um, well, that's pretty much it. I'm just going to report it as a rumor and not fact because ultimately these are not my sources and I'm going with someone else, but they seem pretty confident, they being Fudzilla. They have industry sources, and according to them, AMD loses at least 100 US dollars per every Vega 64 that sells at 500 US dollars. Now, to be honest with you, I'm pretty certain this is right, because according to Gibbo, uh, Overclockers UK, you can do the search yourself, you don't have to take my word for it, but according to Gibbo at OC UK, they were essentially reimbursed 100 Great British Pounds for every Vega that was sold. I believe their inventory was like 250 of the launch card prices. Don't quote me on that. And we've all seen the various invoices that have been floating around online, which basically show that the the uh, shops themselves, although we didn't see Overclockers UK invoices, but other shops have been buying the cards at a ridiculous markup in some instances. So what basically means is that AMD are paying a lot of money for the HBM2. Plus, the packaging and the substrate itself are just basically bending them over a barrel. So you're in this kind of weird position where some people are able to buy Vega at pretty decent prices. I've got a friend who just bought one at a decent price. On the other hand, you are getting others that literally can't buy them or they're part of their you know, those bundles. And because no one wants to really buy the bundles, in some instances, and I say some, because obviously it does depend upon your region and the e-tailer themselves, they have the bundles available, yes, but the separate cards, not so much. So it would appear, and I'm saying it would appear because obviously I don't want to say that this is fact, it would appear that AMD have a couple of strategies here. One, make money back from the bundles or at least reduce their hours, if you prefer, and the second is to increase their market share. This one's pretty obvious. If you have at least a card which is able to compete with your competitors, it's a better thing than just not having an answer to the competitors. They'd rather lose a small amount of money overall, but have a card which is going to increase their mind share, possibly for the long term, where we either see improve, improvements in drivers, which might you know increase performance, or they're able to reduce the price or of production of Vega, or, of course, Navi. Because ultimately, if you can increase the mind share, the market share, and the desire of people to buy your products, ultimately, that means that you are going to be able to, well, make profit in the long term. So it's more of a long-term strategy, to be honest with you. And there's a lot of debate whether this is a good thing or a bad thing. To be honest, I think it's well outside the remit of this video. But... My personal opinion is if, if AMD can get the price down of the Vega 56, uh, this is whether this news is true or not, by the way, if they can get the price down of production and sell it at the price they had initially told us for both, all, for all of the cards, not just for Vega 56, but especially for Vega 56, if they could do that, I don't feel that many people would be served to buy a GTX 1070. In fact, I would probably even suggest a 56 over a 1080, especially now in the light of this mod. That's just how it is, because I'm just calling it how I see it. Now, yes, of course, that's not to say that everyone would be better to do that. If you've got a G-Sync monitor or whatever, then obviously NVIDIA is your go-to. But in general, if you've not bought into a particular ecosystem yet, then if AMD can reduce the cost of HBM2 or the packaging or whatever else they need to do, then perhaps AMD in the long term is going to have a pretty damn good product on their hands. But we'll just have to wait and see. Okay, so we're now going to discuss a little bit more in terms of detail of the Vega 10 architecture, specifically the SOC and other parts that go into it. So, you know, Hot Chips was pretty helpful in that respect. So the Vega 10 SOC is huge. Um, I think most of us knew this anyway, 
but it is of course built on the 14nm FinFET process with a area of square size of 486 uh, square mm with 12.5 billion transistors. The fact that we're up to billions now just absolutely startles me even so. Two stacks of HBM. Um, this is, a, of course, HBM2 with up to 484 gigabytes per second with ECC, error correction. And finally, that, if you notice, is with 4, 8, or 16 gigabyte capacity. So most of that stuff has been simply uh, reinforced anyway. The only slight slight bit of information you could glean from that is the fact that you could in theory put in four gigabyte cart uh total memory but i think a most of us knew that that was a possibility and b i i don't really see many people buying it even if hbc c became incredibly popular and it worked as advertised with all of the different games i uh, i just don't think marketing wise you can sell a four gigabyte card right now i, I just don't think it would work hey Maybe AMD will prove me wrong. And if they could, and it performs as well, then great. Uh, now we have architectural layout. Um, this is kind of interesting because you can see the Infinity Fabric essentially acting as the, well, yeah, the fabric. Literally the cohesive unit at the very bottom there. And then you've got the core fabric and the CPs at the top and bottom respectively. So this basically the Infinity Fabric, that is, acts as an interconnect within in the entire uh, GPU architecture. It looks very different, actually, from the block diagrams of Fiji. For a start, you can see that it's a single graphics engine, and yes, you still have uh, asynchronous compute engines. You have four of them. Four DSBRs, also known as drawstream binning rasterizers, 64 pixel units, 256 texture units. And of course, there is a workload manager, which does exactly what you'd think it does on the tin. It, well, manages the workload. Of course, 64 next generation compute units, NCUs, and the obligatory level 2 cache as well on GPUs, which is 4 megabytes. What is rather interesting, however, for those of us who would utilize a lot of uh, uh, virtualization work. In theory, it can support up to 16 VMs and guest containers with native drivers. So in other words, you could, in theory at least, have an awful lot of work running on lots of different virtual machines on the same graphics card. And it will do this by essentially partitioning parts of the GPU or memory to that requisite uh, VM. So in other words, let's say you have two VMs, it would basically segment the memory, segment resources as required, um, and obviously how the administrator has decided to partition up those resources. So for example, it could do it 50-50, 75-25, you get the general gist. What is quite interesting is one slide specifically does mention hash in cryptocurrencies. Uh, extended ISA with 40 new instructions, I suspect, will be made public. And essentially, it's telling us, well, guess what? These GPUs are pretty damn good when it comes to cryptocurrency, which is basically AMD, for lack of a better term, actually just embracing it and saying, hey, we know we're just going to make money from this now. At some point or another, I might in investigate virtualization, but honestly, AMD did not release as much detail. In fact, we have gone over the Volta-based um, architecture a few days ago as well, the Tesla V100, and honestly, I think NVIDIA, from memory, actually gave a bit more information than what AMD did, although, honestly, AMD have been quite forthcoming with the Vega architecture anyway, so... There's not that much left for them to reveal, I guess, technically. With all of that said, hopefully you have found this video interesting and informative. I'm going to bugger off now, so take care of yourselves, and bye for now.